they did not say or what did not get through the very reasonable tight security censorship that gave a real indication of what our terrible new weapon achieved. Correspondents at air headquarters on Guam, including CBS's Webley Edwards, though they could not attribute it to any specific source, were allowed to say, there is reason to believe that the Japanese city of Hiroshima, approximately the size of Memphis or Seattle or Rochester, New York, no longer exists. General Spot smiled when asked if the new atomic bomb would be dropped again in the near future. But every indication is that it will be, for he announced that more B-29s are ready to follow the pathfinder which hit Hiroshima, and that the atomic bombers would operate Air Force bases in the Marianas. To all questions as to how the bomb is carried, how large it is, or from what altitude it was dropped, the general was pleasant but uncommunicative. What little we know of the dramatic details are in the eyewitness stories told by members of the Super Fortress crew that carried the atomic bomb to its target. Only three men in the plane knew exactly what their mission was. The others knew only that they were doing a highly important secret job. Colonel Paul Tibbetts of Miami, Florida, piloted the Super Fort named Enola Gay after his mother. The other two men who had put the full knowledge of their mission were Captain William S. Carson of Santa Fe, a Navy ordnance expert, and the plane bombardier Major Thomas W. Ferraby of Mottville, North Carolina. Colonel Tibbetts, who has been specially trained for the mission, received the distinguished service cross from General Spot as soon as the plane returned to the Marianas. Tibbetts told newsmen in a matter-of-fact voice that the bomb run up to Hiroshima was uneventful right up to the dramatic moment of bombs away. Then he saw a flash, felt the saw a flash. The Sun Navy had decided on Hiroshima, he said, was just like a practice run. And here's the way he tells the story. It was 9.15 a.m. when we dropped our bomb and turned the plane broadside to get the best view. Then we made as much distance from the ball of fire as we could. We were at least 10 miles away, he went on, when there was a visual impact even though every man wore colored glasses for protection. We had braced ourselves when the bomb was gone for the shock. Then we saw what looked like a close burst of anti-aircraft fire. And somebody said, my God, and we couldn't believe what happened. A mountain of smoke was going up in a mushroom with a stem coming down. At the top, Captain Parson continued, was white smoke. But up to a thousand feet from the ground, there was a swirling, boiling dust. Soon afterwards, small fires sprang up on the edge of the town, but the town itself was entirely obscured. We stayed around for two or three minutes, and by that time, the smoke had risen to 40,000 feet. Both Captain Parson and Colonel Tibbetts described the explosions as tremendous and awe-inspiring. Neither would give any estimate of the damage done, but they said it must have been extensive. The Air Force was not willing to trust the human eye to record the Hiroshima attack. Cameras were taken along, but photographs taken at the time of the bombing showed only smoke, and four hours later, additional photos still showed smoke obscuring the target and rising to 40,000 feet, almost seven and a half miles into the heavens. Obviously, the War Department is still not ready to release full details of the Hiroshima attack, but we are told that sometime tomorrow, we will be given an official summary of just what happened. President Truman is back in this country, en route to Washington from Newport News, Virginia, where his cruiser docked some hours ago, and it may be that the White House, too, will have something to add to its story of the new atomic bomb. <laughs>